Okay, uh, today we're going through some of our Moculatus pleiades. Uh, I don't say Zephophorus Moculatus because these are aquarium strain uh, fish. They're Moculatus type. Uh, the, we're going through the various strains that have red in them and the red coloration came actually came from crossing my mo Zephophorus Moculatus with Zephophorus hellerii, the, uh, the green sword tail. Uh, we took heavy hits in this greenhouse, uh, and but the Moculatus, so far we, we found some of all, but they're in pretty bad uh, selection shape. So what I'm doing is selecting all the red types. I'm going to sort them out and uh, uh, do red Mickey Mouse, red tuxedo, uh, red wag, and red. And we're going to get some of each in almost every vat that we go through. Uh, they've just been, you know, we, we haven't done anything with them uh, uh, since the storm. And color types uh, rapidly deteriorate if you're not going through them periodically. Okay, I'm going to go down here to row, uh, this is row E in Greenhouse 2. I'm going to go down to bat 11, which, hang on a second, I need to check what's in it. It's uh, supposed to be red Moculatus. By the way, Susie's sorting out uh, some little fish. These are some red wag fry that she's sorting out and separating them out from cherry shrimp, which we... Uh, culture, uh, polyculture with the fish. They do really well with live bearers. Uh, okay, so we're going to go down to 2E11. I should explain something about, before we get into this vat, I should explain something about why uh, we've had su such problems with live bearers. It started with Hurricane Harvey over three years ago, three years ago last August. Uh, we had to, when, when we finally decided that the storm was actually going to hit us with hurricane force winds, we had uh, a choice. We could let the greenhouses get crushed or we could come out and Carl, who's behind the, the camera, Carl and I came out about 10.30 uh, that night as uh, hurricane force winds were getting, you know, starting to hit and we cut all this plastic on the top of the greenhouses out. Uh, we had a double layer. First we had a layer of shade cloth we had to pull down. Then we cut uh, the two layers of plastic out, slit them up, long, uh, knives on long poles. And the reason for that is that these greenhouses are rated for winds of up to 70 miles an hour. Hurricane force winds, we got hit over 100 miles an hour. Uh, we learned in uh, 2003 with Hurricane Claudette that uh, if you don't cut the plastic out, you end up with a crushed greenhouse. That one was a little bit of a surprise. Claudette at 8.30 in the morning was a tropical storm coming on shore, meaning it had less than 70 mile an hour winds. And we're about 25 miles inland, expected to weaken. It blew up into a category two storm and we did not, we only had greenhouse one at the time. We did not uh, cut the top out, and we ended up with greenhouse one completely crushed. All the water lines uh, broken, uh, all the the structure crushed in. Uh, so we had to hurriedly build greenhouse two, move surviving fish over to it, and then the next summer we rebuilt greenhouse one. So we made the decision on a Friday night that the storm actually was going to get here, and we cut the tops out. Harvey dumped 14 inches of rain into the greenhouses, destroyed our expensive greenhouse heaters, destroyed a bunch of our above ground water pumps. Yeah, we covered them as best we could, but still uh, the, some of them were destroyed right away. Others failed over, the late, over later months. So we saved the structures and saved most of our fish but, well, I should add, we were out of power for eight days, so we are running on a generator that was kind of bulky, and we had to babysit a lot. Uh, 
running short of propane, but we managed to get through that with adequate propane with generator running and finally got commercial power back. We found tons of, and literally tons of leaf and stem debris in the greenhouses that got blown in from neighboring trees. Uh, mostly Weesatch and Mesquite, which are two natives here. Uh, some oak, some ash leaves. And over the next few months, as we struggled to clean everything up, we found that a lot of our live bears weren't breeding. They're fat and healthy, but they weren't breeding. And mollies especially were impacted, especially the sailfin mollies. Short fin mollies, not so much. Uh, the Zephophorines were impacted, but not quite as much as the Mollies. So what we found is it took almost two years to get adequate reproduction to rebuild our breeding colonies. And we were just getting up to speed when, uh, when the winter storm hit. So we're dealing with the remnants of the survivors of Hurricane Harvey and now uh, another set of remnants that survived uh, the winter storm. The winter storm temperatures in the greenhouse, in this greenhouse dropped in, the water temperatures dropped into the low 50s uh, Fahrenheit. The uh, lots and lots of dead fish and our plant filters were impacted by the cold weather as well. So we en ended up with sky high ammonia reading. So the fish that are that survived, the breeders that survived, tolerated the cold and tolerated high ammonia levels. It only took us a couple weeks to get the plants back up and running to get uh, ammonia under control, and it's now at zero like it usually is. So anyway, we're taking all of our red type, red moculatus type fish, the red wags, reds, uh, tuxedos, and sorting them to try to rebuild breeding colonies. This is supposedly uh, Moculatus red, uh, and it had a bunch of, uh, of young breeders in it. This, this is a, in each of our library breeder vats, we have what we call a fry cage. This is quarter inch uh, aquaculture grade netting we use aquaculture grade because it's non-toxic to fish. It has a bottom tied to it. And inside of it, we have a cichlid hotel, which we use in 300 gallon breeding vats as well. It's the same aquaculture netting. We build these cylinders about a foot long, take a foot long piece of uh, two inch PVC and zip, zip tie or tie wrap these. These are recycled plastic uh, zip ties, tie wraps, uh, cable ties, whatever you want to call them. That came loose, I need to fix it. Uh, we put this, the uh, PVC in there because this stuff floats uh, and PVC uh, holds it down. Okay, I'm going to bang it around getting a shrimp out. Got a couple. Then I'm going to take this, there's shrimp, a bunch of red ram's horns. I just do not have the red ram's horns, but they're this is an ecosystem. They're established in here and almost nothing we can do about it. If we decided to kill the snails, we'd also kill a lot of our invertebrates, the scuds and shrimp that we raise. So we put up with them. Uh, snails, unfortunately, <coughs> can't be shipped interstate without a permit that requires all kinds of inspections. And uh, air, it, it's just too big of a hassle. So we don't ship uh, snails out of state. So you can see there are a few juvenile fish in there, some cherry shrimp, a bunch of red ram's horns. Okay, we've got some, we always put some uh, horn work in the vats, uh, for also for the fry to hide in. I'm going to add that to our scud vat, because the scuds will eat it, it's scud food, and uh, I'll put fresh horn work in the vat when we set it up. I'm going to scoop out a bunch of this duckweed, get it out of my way. That, I've been told by some of our Australian followers, is 20 bucks worth of duckweed in Australia. Uh, 
here. I toss it in the gutter. Scuds don't eat it for some reason, uh, whereas some fish do, and it'll drift down to the, the sump, and some of the mollies and some of the cichlids will, will eat it and keep it under control. Uh, obviously, the platies don't eat it. Okay, so now I'm going to, this is a, we found this is a perfect size net uh, it, for these 55 gallon vats. It kind of fits in there and, and with a few scoops we can get most of the fish out. You can see there are some of the breeders and some of the juveniles and some shrimp. Oops. Dropped a nice male on the... <laughs> on the ground and the shrimp. That's stormy in the background. She's an internet sensation these days. Say hi to the camera, Stormy. There are you have to go? Okay, well. <laughs> no, that's okay. In the morning? Okay, see you then. Okay, Stormy is, uh, started work for us as a high school student at Goliad High School. She's now going to Victoria College in Victoria. And uh, she works for us when she can. Apparently, she has a bunch of tests coming up right now. Okay, so I can, I'm just going to try to get most of the fish out. Still getting a few juveniles. Looks like I've got most of them. Now we're going to go to the next step. Let's see. I think Susie ripped off my nets. I think I'm going to start putting my name on nets and siphon tubes. Susie and uh, Stormy seem to think they can use my equipment. That was mine. Yeah, I found the culprit. Susie had my siphon tube. Okay, on the siphon tubes, you'll note we have this PVC deal uh, piece, uh, rigid piece, and we put a T on the end. The reason for that is that if a, a fish, especially a bigger fish, gets sucked up against there, there's not as much pressure because there's water coming in the other side. If you had just one hole, you can uh, fish gets sucked up against it, it's dead. Okay, so I'm gonna start the siphon. I put a net down because we still have shrimp and juveniles in here. So if the siphon picks them up, the, the net will capture them. I'm gonna turn the water off and what we'll do is let this siphon down and I'll come back and clean the vat and get the rest of the fish. Okay, this is a few minutes later. Uh, show you the setup here. The, we still have the siphon in there. It's, it's siphoned down and through a net. We have the bucket that I had already put some fish in. I'm going to set it over here. I have two empty buckets that are going to be used for uh, cleaning. So I take the siphon out, set it aside, check the net. And yeah, there's some juveniles and shrimp that went through the siphon. And I put them in this bucket. And this is a 10 inch coarse fish net we use uh, as part to run the siphons through. This is a 10 inch micro, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, not Daphne, uh, uh, brine shrimp net. I'm, I'll think of everything in a second. This is a 10 inch brine shrimp net. And it, it's interesting, it's just the right coarseness that we can get the mom 
out of the vats with it. And we clean the vats. And that's what I'm going to do. There's about two or three inches, no, about three inches of water in that vat. I'm just going to go in a circular motion. And you can see it's caught water and a, a bunch of the mine that gathers on the bottom of the vat. And I'm just going to keep netting it out so the water looks fairly clean. By the way, this mulm is loaded with beneficial organisms. Nitrosomus bacteria, nit nit nitrobacter bacteria, those are the ones that convert ammonia to, to nitrite and nitrite to nitrates, and nitrate is not very toxic. Uh, our plants do a lot of that work, but the, these bacteria help. Also, it's loaded with paramecium and some cyclops, and that makes good food for the little fish to fry. Uh, and when we raise small fry like bettas or tetras and stuff, we uh, scoop out the mom. See, so the bats empty now. There are no fish in it. I'm going to turn the water on so it doesn't float anymore. While I'm here, I'm going to clean the strainers. We have two strainers in the vat that water overflows out of the vat through. And that inhibits fry from going out, although some fry do escape, which accounts for some of the, the uh, feral fish in the gutters and some. Put those back in. And prop this up so it stays in place. And that will fill. And let me get rid of this duckweed. Then let, I'm going to let that water settle a little bit, come back and, and pour off any fish and shrimp. But right now, we're going to set this bat back up for breeding because I know I've got some red uh, maculatus type breeders. So I'm just going to set up the fry cage in that cichlid hotel. I'm going to reach over here on a 300 gallon vat and get some hornwort, shake it out to make sure there aren't any uh, cichlid fry in there and drop that in. And this vat's now ready for the next set of breeders. Then I'm going to take this bucket up. This is probably set, this sat long enough. I can probably pour it off now and save a trip down the walkways. Just slowly pour it off, and the mom settles to the bottom. The fish, when they cooperate, there's a juvenile and shrimp. There's one that wasn't cooperating. Another one. Okay, looks like I got them. What I'm going to do is take a, this coarse net. Pour into there. It's got a bunch of duckweed and stuff. Oh, there's a breeder. Put it with these guys and we'll go up front and start sorting through. I'll come back and pour that bucket off one more time just to make sure I got everybody out of it. Then that mom will go to our worm beds to, and compost piles. Composting some fantastic plant soil. Okay, on this one I'm going to add water I want to clean it up before I pour the fish off again so we're going to let this sit for a bit and we'll see what Susie has for me to look at those are some red wag fry there's some off colors in there and there's a little fish that she missed And I'll pick a bat, put them in later. And I already have some sorting that's going on over here. I have uh, some red Mickey Mouse. Uh, excuse me, those are, yeah, that's red Mickey Mouse. I have a high thin red male in there. I put him in there because I'm hoping to get uh, some high thin 
red Mickey Mouse. These are some reds. There's a little high fan male. These are some red wags plus a couple. This high fan male has uh, also has a tuxedo in him, but I'll probably use him. That's a nice high fin female right there. She doesn't have great color, but she's got good fins. And we'll fix the color later. I'm just trying to rebuild breeding colonies from the remnants. Okay, let me scoop off some of this duckweed. We'll pour these and I'll start sorting this batch. When I finish the first sort on it, if I can find a bucket. So do you have buckets over there? Oh, here's one. Uh, Stormy had to leave early today and she usually keeps the buckets cleaned and ready and she didn't get to all of them. Okay, what I'm doing now is just trying to separate any last bit of debris. Get the, you see quite a few shrimp in there. I want to get all the fish out at least. Let's see, it's more, I'm more a little platy. I think I got all the fish. Let's add some water to the shrimp. And what I'll do, Susie can, any that I missed, Susie can sort out when she's sorting shrimp. She does all the shrimp. She selects the, the best as breeders. And you know, then we sell off uh, the other good ones, uh, bad colors, which that bucket has. Those are shrimp that aren't going to have very good color. These are shrimp that are good enough to sell. And these are shrimp she set aside as breeders. And you see the percentage of bad color is fairly low. Uh, there's easily a thousand shrimp there and it looks like it may be a couple dozen off colors. Okay, so now I have a bucket that has some shrimp in it. Once again, I need to find a net. Okay. And I'm going to take this. I poured this off. I'm going to just uh, pour it through this net. Okay, and you can see some of the shrimp, uh, some of the fish, and and shrimp. Oh, sorry. Should have done this first. And I'm going to put these in this jar so I can look at them. See, did I get all the shrimp? Okay, can we clear off a little bit of this duckweed? Glass is on. Okay. I like that red male there. The females aren't good, but I can't be picky at this point. The, the trick in getting good fish is to raise a lot of them, so I need females. Those are three nice females. And I'm putting them in the bucket of reds I'd already set aside. Nice female. Nice color on that one. Another nice female. Bad color on her, but like I say, we like to have uh, 40 to 60 females in our breeding colonies and definitely are not going to have that, so I can't be too picky. We'll fix the color in, a, in future generations. Okay, I'm going to add this. I got out uh, the potential breeders, everything else, juveniles, and that becomes Susie's problem now. Add a little bit of water to this and move this bucket over for her. She's going to separate out the fry and shrimp, sort the shrimp into sale shrimp, bad shrimp, and reader shrimp. And when we set up these vats, we'll be adding about 30 to 40 really good shrimp to it, and we end up getting producing shrimp and, and fish at the same time. Hopefully, three to four hundred fish 
once we have the breeding colonies back up to where they ought to be, we'll produce each breeding cycle, which is three to four months during the summer. We'll produce uh, two to four hundred fish and probably more, more shrimp than that. Uh, so what we're trying to do is do red wags, Mickey Mouse uh, reds, and red platies. And I think this is working on red tuxedos. And there'll be some off-colored red tuxedos. There'll be reds or red wags, and we'll separate those out. And I'll end up with small breeding colonies. It looks like I'll be lucky to have 20 fish in a breeding colony. Uh, so we're easily a couple cycles away from being back to where we should be. Okay, uh, we're going to take, uh, we're going to go process these other uh, bats and then we'll come back and talk about the breeders we're setting up and show you setting up, a, a putting the fish back in. These are the remnants of our red tuxedo breeders. We've got another bat, so I'm hoping to get more. Uh, See, there aren't very many. There are, we do have quite a few fry. Okay, and as usual, this kind of threw um, various things. So this is a male uh, Gambusia punctata. I'm gonna set over here. Carl is gonna take it to his aquarium at home. This is a red wag. She doesn't have great color, but again, we just don't have much choice here. That's a nice big female punctata. I mean, I'll just drop her there temporarily. These are a couple red tuxedos. Set them aside. Susie's going to be sorting out the fry. Uh, here's a uh, high fan female red wag. That's good. A couple more tuxedos. We're doing four different colors here uh, with red base color and then different uh, fan color patterns. Uh, and since we haven't been able to, oh, there's a little high fin nondescript fish. Uh, I'll decide what to do with him. I want to keep all the high fins we can. Some more Gambusia. Let's get another bucket for them. I like this Gambusia. They have blue eyes and it's a big fish and it's not nearly as mean as Gambusia finis. It's from Cuba. Okay, and there are some babies. She had babies. So the blue eyed fish in there. Okay, I'm going to let Susie sort this stuff out. Let's see, was that this? That was this one. Okay, and. And I've got another bucket I'm going to, that came from the last bit of uh, red Mickey Mouse when I cleaned the vat. Let's see if I've got anything in here. Yeah, a few juveniles. What we've decided to do, since we don't have very many fish, normally each one of these uh, four colors of fish would have three vats, a breeder vat, a fry vat, and a sail vat. And we'd have 40 uh, to 60 uh, breeders and few hundred fry and a few hun uh, hundred fish to sell. Uh, okay, there's a little Mickey Mouse. I'm going to set it aside and see if we need to add it to the breeders. That's an off-color Mickey Mouse. No, it's not a Mickey Mouse, but it's off-color. I'll probably put it in the miscellaneous it's at. There's a Mickey Mouse. Not great color, but we'll work with them. There's a red. One of these days, 
I played around with uh, a whiteboard and, and doing uh, Punnett squares to show the genetics of these fish. And uh, it did not work so well. I've got to work out some technical issues on it. Uh, get better markers and also learn not to use a wet finger on the, uh, the uh, board because then it smears. Uh, while we're waiting for a second, I want to discuss housekeeping, neatness and stuff because there's a, out of our couple, uh, I guess 20 plus thousand or no, over 10,000 followers, we have a couple people who uh, complain, actually one person who complains about things aren't being neat. He actually calls them nasty. And what I'd like to point out is that basically Susie and myself and Stormy as a part-time employee handle about 800 bats. If we kept things spick and span, which by the way, the fish don't care if it's not <laughs> spick and span. If we kept things spick and span, we wouldn't have time to do any fish. Uh, we would just, we might have some really pretty greenhouses, no algae growing on the vats and stuff, but uh, we wouldn't have time for fish. So what would be the use? Uh, balm in the tanks, I think is beneficial. Uh, you don't want that in a, a display aquarium, it's, it's unsightly, but uh, for raising fish, it's beneficial. Uh, it's a constant food so, uh, source for little fish, and it's loaded with back, uh, beneficial bacteria. So we don't overclean tanks. And uh, for your your home aquariums, do not overclean your, your filters. Uh, I recommend having two filters and cl alternating cleaning them and don't clean them too much because uh, if you over clean you are removing all the bacteria that are controlling ammonia and i've noticed on facebook the biggest one of the biggest problems people have is uh, water quality control we don't have that problem except for the two weeks after the hurricane when we were dealing with tons of literally tons of dead fish uh, from cold weather uh, if you haven't watched those videos, go back and you'll see us hauling tractor bucket loads of fish out to feed to the local buzzards. At any rate, we don't keep this uh, green, these greenhouses for aesthetic reasons. We keep them for raising fish and uh, over cleaning would just take time away from the fish, which is what we're trying to do. Okay, uh, I'm going to go do a couple more vats, and then we'll discuss uh, setting up these four different colors of breeders with what few remnants we have. Okay, uh, I've pre-sorted all of our red uh, moculatus. There are four different types. There's the red, red Mickey Mouse, uh, red wag, and red tuxedo. Uh, doesn't look like very many potential breeders of any of them. I have a couple buckets of juveniles of the four different colors. I'm just gonna put them together and I'll, uh, three months from now, I'll go through and, and color sort and add breeders to it breeding colonies. It's going to take a few cycles to straighten these fish up. And one thing I've noticed so far is that we lost the plume tail gene. I'm hoping that as we get into some of the other moculatus or variatus that we have that gene left. I've had that gene since, when was it? That was 2004, wasn't it, Susie? Uh, I bought two uh, really ugly little plume tail uh, male platies uh, at auction. Somebody was insisting upon bidding against me, but I finally won. And fortunately, Susie was out of the room. 
when she came back, she asked what I bought. And I said, I'll oh, just some stuff. And she picked up the bag and said, what are these? Feeders? And I said, no, no, they're plume tails. They, they've got the gene I've been looking for. She said, what did you pay for? And I said, I don't know. I didn't really pay attention. I got in trouble about it later. But she had to eat her words a, a year or two later when we developed some really, really nice ones. Uh, if you go to our website, you can see photos of some of the uh, nice plume tails we developed. Okay, and also I think I wrote an article for Tropical Fish Hobbyist uh, magazine when I was writing the, I did the live bearer column for three years, and I think I wrote about uh, that process of introducing that gene into other colors. Okay, I'm going to do the reds first. I've got a bucket of them here. I'm going to drop them in this jar where I can take a look at them and count the males and females and any juveniles I want to keep. I'm going to go ahead and put some fresh water in this bucket for them. Okay, I'm not really pleased with a lot of the color on the females like that one. Uh, that one's better, but I can't be picky. We need reproduction. We need a bunch of fish. So I'm going to do uh, store females. Looks like they're all nice and gravid. Six. Seven, eight. There's a high pen male. I'm going to put him in there. He's not a great high fin, but he has the gem, the gene that I need. High fin and platys is a, uh, or in all the Zephopherin sword tails and platys, is a uh, dominant gene, and it's also lethal uh, in the homozygous state, so you can never set the strain. Although later on you'll see when I talk about our uh, true bleeding, uh, true bleeding, true bleeding high fins. Uh, the, there is another gene that several of us have found. These all look like males. That's a little female there. I like his color. I'm going to put him in there. I've got long females and that high fin male and, and that dark male. And the rest of these are just not going to be kept out. Oh. I'll just dump them in with the juveniles. Okay, so our breeding colony of reds so far, I may find that I have some over here. I have one male, one regular male, one high fin male, and nine regular females. Now the high fin male, if he produces half the offspring, half of those offspring will be uh, high fins, the other half won't be because he is heterozygous for high fin or he wouldn't be existing because the uh, homozygous, uh, any any embryo that in, inherits two copies of high fin die before they're born. Okay, so I'm gonna set these guys aside. Next we're going to do I'd like to point out that normally with these four fish, pre-Harvey and the winter storm, we would have had uh, three vats of each one. So we would have been de dealing with 12 vats. Uh, we would have had the breeders and, and uh, new f uh, fry. We would have had uh, a fry vat just grown and ready to sort. And we would have an adult vat that we'd be selling from. And we've assorted those vats into breeders, uh, fry, and fish to sell. Uh, and we would have had three to six hundred fish of each of these types. So we've got a long way to go to catch up with where we were pre-Harvey. Okay, I think I'll do the Mickey Mouse next. And they don't None of these have very good color, but I've got to use what I've got. Okay, let's take a look here. 
not a very good female, but she is a high fan. Hey, when you tell us something about the fish, let us look at it for a minute. After oh, okay. Okay, this is a high fan red, so I'm going to move her to the other breeding colony. And change the records over here. Okay. Let me get this high fan Mickey Mouse out. She doesn't have a great Mickey Mouse pattern. She doesn't have two dots, but she is a high pen. Her color, red color is not great, but we'll work on that later. There's another high pen red, not a very good one, but I'm going to move her over there. To the high and the reds. Oh, there's a little high pen red male. So I'm going to add him. Give us a little longer look at it. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, well, here, here's another red high fan male. So I'm going to go back to that that group and purge the non high fan male to increase the odds that we get. Uh, right fish. And here's a little one. I don't, he doesn't look great, but I'm going to use him anyway. Uh, not a very good group of fish here. That's a male I don't want to use. I'm going to use this male. There's a couple little females. Basically, I want to use all the females regardless of how ugly they are. As long as they have the Mickey Mouse pattern. Another okay little male, I'll put him in there. I like him for his color. Any more females? There's one. That's a little thin at all. That could be a little thin at all. And those are all males that I don't like. Maybe that little guy right there. The rest of them go in with the juveniles. Okay, let's see what we got out of those. We got one high fin female, a motley group of fish, but give me a couple generations and we'll get them fixed up. Okay, let's do the red wags next. Okay, let's take a look at these guys. Really nice female. She's got injured at some point. There's a high fin female and a regular female. Little high fin male, ugly color. We'll take a look, see if we get somebody with a couple. Not very good red wag females, but they'll do. She's got bad color, but I don't, I don't. there's no choice. Right. After you tell us about them, uh, count to three in your head <laughs> quietly before you pull them out. Okay, this is a bad red wag, but it is a wag, and it's a nice big female, and she has basic uh, red. She's got some iridescence that uh, we'll breed out later, but right now I just need a bunch of fish. Okay, here's a, another uh, female similar to that one, but it's also a high fin, so I'm going to keep it. That male doesn't have very good uh, dorsal, 
The little guy is pretty decent. He's young, doesn't have a really good wag pattern. This guy's got some other genes that we're going to use him anyway. Just at that point where we can't be that picky. Same thing with that little male, these two little males. They have freckled genes, but we'll breed that out later. Here's a high fence female. Also, too much iridescence, but we're going to use her. Okay, let's see what we got here. Those are all juveniles. So we ended up with only 12 fish, uh, so six regular females. Oh well, we'll get a couple hundred offspring out of them and, and uh, we'll go, be going through these two buckets. We'll set up these two buckets of juveniles, grow them up and, and augment the breeding colony next time. Or augment all the breeding colonies. Okay, now we're going to do red tuxedos. Mm -hmm. What's sad is we lost the plum tail gene in these. I'm hoping, like I said earlier, that we have it in some other color in our blues so that I can breed it back into this line. I was working on developing a high fin plume tail lyre tail. I did that a long time ago. And uh, that way, with plume, plume tail is a dominant gene, but it's not a homozygous lethal, so you can set it. Uh, and so we get all plume tails. High fins uh, can get as many as three quarters in a mating. And lyre tail, the males are usually functionally sterile, so you uh, can't fix it. But if we had everybody plume tails, some of them high fins and some of them uh, lyre tails and some of them high fin plume tail lyre tails, they would be worth more. Okay, let's take a look here. That's a fairly decent little female. Huh. That's actually a, a red tailed black viriatus, but I'm going to leave her in there. Doesn't hurt to outcross. Not a really good pattern, but good dark color. Couple of okay things out. Hey, count to one one thousand in your head after you tell us what you can say before you pull them out. Okay, I get impatient. Now, not great color, but she's got the tuxedo jaw. I didn't count, did I? You didn't. Okay. Uh, here's a high fan female and a non high fan. I'm going to use both of those. Excellent, well done. Okay. Those are males, male. Those are all males. I think I'm just going to pick those three males. They're big, they're good. And the these can go into the juveniles and they might get picked next time. So what do we end up with here? One high fin female, three males, three regular males, one high fin female. Let's see, it's 10, 11 fish. Wow, a big breeding colony, seven. Okay, we're going to start putting these up. I'm going to carry these two buckets of juveniles down first. And put them in their vat. Like I said, we'll let them grow up and we'll color sort next time and uh, augment the breeding colonies with the right colors. And with any luck, there'll be some high things in there. Throw a little bit of hornwort in there. And toss in a couple of mystery snails. Don't tell Susie I'm doing this. She wants to purge mystery snails from all the bats. Okay, now do the four sets of breeders. Tuxedos go to E9. 
and the reds go to E11. No, I'm sorry. Yeah, E9 and E11. Pathetically small breeding colonies and not the quality I like, but we will get there. I guess I could go buy replacement fish, but we've had these fish a lot of generations and these are obviously some very tough fish because they survived low water temperatures and high ammonia. Okay, let's see the red wags. Mickey Mouse go to F13, and the red wags go to E24. Let's do those first. And you'll note each one of the breeding colonies has a fry cage and in that fry cage is a cichlid hotel and has some horn work. That gives the fry a bunch of places to hide. Okay, and red Mickey Mouse, good, F13. I'm picking uh, mystery snails out of the buckets of mom. The buckets of mom will go out to our compost pile and worm bed. The uh, mystery snails I just toss in the gutter and they can go do whatever they want to do in there. They seem to help control pond snails and red ram's horns. Uh, I suspect eating their egg cases. Okay, oh, here a few more fry. Are you done the fish? Okay, go put these into E10. Okay, these breeder vats, um, yeah. Okay, Susie's selected breeders for each of these vats, so I'm gonna go dump them in. Like I said, we polyculture shrimp with the uh, uh, live bearers. They do well together. And in the, we raise two different things in the same real estate. And they grow on about the same cycle. Both of them will have uh, uh, fish ready to harvest in three to four months. Okay, so we processed four color varieties of red Maculatus type platys this morning. We set up a pair of ancestors. Uh, we went, sorted through a bunch of snails. I'm getting ready to dump a bunch of dime sized gold mystery snails into a vat to grow up. There are a couple of shrimp in there. And then I think we're going to call it a morning. Uh, good snail keeping.